thank you all uh, for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Vanina Farber. I'm a full-time professor uh, at IMD, ELEA Professor of Social Innovation, and I have the privilege to direct the ELEA Center for Social Innovation. And uh, so the idea of to have these webinars came before uh, actually the whole coronavirus crisis, but I think this accelerated uh, the, the process uh, to stay connected and to, to actually try to think of ways to mobilize private capital uh, to unlock or to foster social innovation. And the idea, and I think uh, the ELEA Center was created thanks to the donation or the generous donation of, the, of Peter and his family uh, to IMD. I will introduce him a little bit later. Uh, but I think it was a visionary uh, decision in a certain way uh, to put together uh, two powerhouses or two power ideas. One is the, uh, the idea or, or the, the purpose of IMD that it is to challenge what it is and inspire what it could be and to leverage the access to top corporates that want to transform organizations and we want to support in that process with the LEA Foundation for Ethics and Globalization that puts at the center of its, its purpose uh, how you can uh, use entrepreneurial means to solve, social, to solve absolute poverty, but in general, social or grand challenges. So I think the idea of these webinars in general will be that if, and I think uh, if something good in this, uh, as I was saying, extraordinary times uh, can come up of the coronavirus crisis is this mindset that I'm seeing in, in a lot of my colleagues and corporates and, and clients and around the world is that corporations or businesses need to solve and need to be at the service of society and see, serve social environmental problems, you know, and and I think we are seeing that, that mindset of how can I be useful from who I am? How can I transform fast enough? How can I use my resources to, to serve society? And also a very collaborative mindset, realizing that these challenges are larger that, than all of us and that we need to collaborate. So I think in that, in that take, the idea of this webinar series is to, to think a little bit beyond and go into what happens next. and and to collaborate uh, and come up with solutions and see the different players that can, that can bring about innovation you know, or social innovation. So from that point, so I, I, I don't know if you were seeing me well, so I'm, I'm going to, to change myself a little bit here. So I want to extend the challenge of participating in these webinars. And I want to share with you a little bit what the agenda is going to be, how we're going to organize it, and what's kind of the framework of all the talks and what will be the focus of today. So uh, the first part, I want to know, get to know very, I cannot talk to everybody, we have uh, 90 people here, but I would love to do a little poll to know where you're coming from. You know, since you're here, I will assume that you're interested in how we can mobilize private capital. So I would love to know who you are and know, are you an investor? So I will open a, a poll um, and for you. Let me make sure that you can see it. I hope you can see it. And if you can answer it. So what sector do you come? Who are you from? What lens do you have when addressing the issue of mobilizing private capital. And I, uh, we are going to try to see different sectors and different lenses, uh, but a lot we're gonna have a financial sector lens, but it's interesting that we have people coming from very many different sectors. Okay, so I will wait for a couple of minutes to see how it is. So I hope that poll shows well for everybody. Let me end the poll just to give you an idea. So we have a very nice, uh, representation and I think we have people from non-profit non entrepreneurs, corporates, investors, etc. So just to have this part uh, and so we will try to address and 
you're going to see in the in the following sessions too how we can find uh, cross sector collaborations you know so just to give you a little bit a framework of what we're going to do today so if we look uh, at the spectrum that looks between only financial returns to purely impact focus you know if we look uh, for for like try to look at the social finance spectrum how we can categorize it you now if we start with philo philan traditional philanthropy where there are really even sometimes legal concerns no financial returns expected in most of the cases what we're going to focus today is at what we call philanthropic impact investing and Peter will talk a bit more about that that it you know, it talks about addressing societal challenges sometimes with below market rates and we will see the idea we will discuss a little bit more what is the bridge between commercial money, philanthropic money, etc. And we also can have, and we will have in further speakers, what we call thematic impact investment that puts uh, in, uh, investment or puts financial returns first, that also addresses social and environmental issues, but without having a trade-off with, uh, with the returns. And we also can have a, another part that actually puts impact first on societal challenges with some trade-off. And there is a big academic discussion if there are trade-offs or not trade-offs, if we can build into win-win situations, etc. And we are going to see that some impact investors are actually willing to for, forego some of the returns in order to have, especially when you want to innovate and there are more patient capital, or at least in the short term. After that, we have the more or enter into more public type of finance and what we talk responsible investment and sustainable investment. Some webinars that we're going to have more coming in, a, in, in May than in April will deal with this side of the business. The responsible investment was the most traditional ones, one that actually talk about uh, doing no harm and actually uh, excluding some sectors. And it was with tobacco, with corn or with armaments, et cetera. And, but it's now being extended or uh, should we decarbonize portfolios and should we exclude or engage and also sustainable investment on how to integrate environmental, social and governance ESG criteria into portfolios. And we will have some guest speakers in that arena. So what we're going to focus on this month and it's, it's really what we call impact investing and more on this side of the spectrum that, that you can see here. You know? And specifically today, we have a, a really a privilege of a guest uh, that uh, will talk about philanthropic impact investment. The following two webinars we're going to have, and just a quick publicary is next week, we will have Jean-Philippe Deschrevel from uh, Bamboo Capital, and they're putting together, and he will talk about the challenges of financing the SDGs, and they're creating SDG 500, that is a fund a $500 million fund to finance SDGs. And then we will have the following week, a, a webinar on blended finance with Fabio Segura from the Jaco Foundation that is actually putting or creating or collaborating and creating innovative financial tools to finance quality education, but especially to work with corporates. So here we will see how they're trying to, how they're working with the cocoa industry, with Nestle, with Mendeleev, with um, Mars, in order to deal with uh, quality education and child labor in the value chain. So I hope you join us in the following weeks. Uh, but I want to go a little bit on the focus of today uh, webinar, sorry. So if we are, going to to talk about uh, today is really about uh, impact investing you no know? and when we talk about impact investing on who's an impact investor uh, we have a very specific definition because in many cases you could say okay all investments have an impact so but what do we mean when we talk about an impact investor so when we talk about an impact investor we look at somebody that actively places capital in enterprises that generate a measurable desired beneficial social or environmental outcome that would not occur if his or her investment was not there. So the idea is that this investment has to be uh, actively undesired. So there is an intention 
to uh, achieve a specific social or environmental impact. And another concept that is important is this concept of additionality. So if this impact investor didn't invest in these issues or in these enterprises, commercial money probably wouldn't be available. And then we have an additional part precisely because this is an investment is that we will have a, some expected financial returns that can have a, a broad range between highly concessionary money to above market returns. So really, when we talk about impact investors and a little bit um, this, this definition has four blocks that are, we are gonna use today to talk to Peter. You know, so how does the definition apply in the ELEA context? And uh, what is the intentionality, how they measure impacts? What is the expectation of returns? Because in the case of philanthropic impact investment has a, 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 a very special type of focus. And especially this idea of additionality because it comes with an operational model that the LEA Foundation has. And just now to, to introduce from his vast career, uh, I will point out a couple of, of issues because they think make who he is and what the LEA Foundation or what, the, or what LEA is. So he has a PhD from the University of St. Gallen and he worked from, for 10 years at McKinsey as a consultant, so I think he's passionate about transforming organizations and the skills that come with dealing in transforming organizations comes probably from that period. And then he made a career in the financial sector uh, and banking sector specifically uh, at the end as a CEO of UBS. And I think bringing together his life experience into the ELEA I think makes this very specific combination between ethics and passion and skills uh, that he bring about and I hope uh, you, we all can learn from it. So I will stop talking and ask uh, Peter uh, first part. So what, what is really, what does it mean to be a philanthropic impact investor and what is uh, the intentionality or this focus of the LEA Foundation, of LEA? Well, thank you very much, Vanina, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's great uh, that we have such a diverse and broad uh, turnout to this webinar. Makes me very proud to be invited. So thank you very much. Uh, well, you already started with some of the motivation that then obviously also leads into the inten intentionality of uh, ELEA Foundation. So why did we create ELEA Foundation 14 years ago in 2006? On one hand, it had to do with an ethical view. Uh, I'm convinced that globalization is the biggest, has been the biggest, and is the biggest mega trend of our generation. But we all recognize that globalization uh, is a delicate concept which leaves winners and which leaves losers. Uh, and being born in Switzerland and having had the possibility to do the career that I had, I'm clearly on the winning side. And so I felt there is a ethical responsibility to share some of the globalization gains with those that do not have access to globalization opportunity, hence the name ethics in globalization. Second is passion. I'm an economist from training and I always felt that uh, it should be the noble purpose of economists to understand what poverty is and what can be done about it. So I was incredibly happy last year to see the Nobel Prize for a long period of time now awarded to empirical poverty uh, research. And thirdly, it had to do with capacity, uh, financially, but uh, at least as much uh, in terms of lifetime. I had the privilege to become CEO of a large company at uh, the tender age of 44 years. And since I tried to care for my body, I hope to reach 90 plus years. And so the question was, what do you do after a kind of executive phase? Uh, and so it was also about uh, life energy. So these were the basic motivations to create ELEA. ELEA has a purpose to fight absolute poverty with entrepreneurial means. Absolute poverty means people below $3 daily income. There are close to 2 billion people uh, on the planet uh, that have to cope with less than $3 uh, daily income. And as Vanina said, uh, we are uh, committed to fight poverty with entrepreneurial means. When we created ELEA in 2006, the term impact investing did not yet exist. 
It only was coined in 2007, uh, but uh, we came to recognize that what we are actually doing is philanthropic impact investing. So we invest in company. We do not invest in projects. We invest in companies. Uh, but we do that at an early stage uh, of the company's life when they are still small. They have the startup behind them, so they are post-startup, but they are small, they are risky, they need a lot of support uh, beyond capital, they need mentoring on strategy, on organization, on leadership, on governance, on crisis management, on many, many things. And that makes this model quite expensive. And that's why it takes philanthropic capital uh, to embark. So what do we invest in? And here maybe, Vanina, you can show the next slide um, with the four investment themes. Uh, we have four essential themes in which we are looking for uh, investment opportunities. And they are designed to address a, a key problem of poverty. And the first problem of poverty is that there are about close to 500 million smallholder farmers on this planet, and many of them live in absolute poverty. And so the theory of change behind it is to really provide opportunities for new markets to them. Uh, and so one of our investment opportunities is global agriculture value chains. For example, Coffee Circle, a German uh, enterprise uh, which essentially sources specialty coffee from Ethiopia uh, and helps 25,000 farmers in Ethiopia and in some other countries uh, to gain reliable incomes. The second topic is youth unemployment. Uh, while the world has made huge progress in recent 30 years on fighting analphabetism through building primary schools, there are lots of young people who actually went to school, but they have not acquired skills that enable them to earn a decent income. And so we uh, invest into business models that provide employable skills and that help young people uh, to essentially uh, make a living. An example here is a company in the Philippines, Bagosphere, founded by two Singapore investors, uh, providing short targeted skills trainings to help them become employed by the Philippine business processing uh, industry. They have right now around 2,000 alums and are educating 700 uh, young people per year, uh, enabling them to earn a living. The third, Next to agriculture, the next uh, source of employment is the whole sector of informal retail and last mile distribution. Uh, and this is critical in order to provide access to urban and rural poor people uh, to goods and services at fair prices. And so we invest in uh, organizations that help secure that access. One example here is Dharma Life, uh, an Indian entrepreneur from Germany uh, who built a network of Dharma Life entrepreneurs in villages and who can reach 40,000 villages in India, 10 million people, uh, providing them access to both products as well as services and information. For example, campaigns on hygiene, com hand washing hands, uh, campaigns on the use of uh, clean energy are just some examples. And then the fourth topic are digital solutions that can address one of the, uh, one of the other problems uh, and uh, where obviously there is a lot of leverage through all the innovation that we have seen in the digital space. An example here is Angaza. Uh, Vanina did an mm -hmm. uh, academic case on Angaza, a California enterprise that essentially invented a pay-as-you-go system uh, to help uh, the solar lamps be used align, uh, along the kind of uh, payment of uh, money uh, so that people can afford uh, to amortize solar lamps uh, with this mobile-based technology. Uh, and Gaza has reached about 5 million people in many countries uh, with its technology. So these are uh, some of the examples uh, where we invest always uh, along the lines to uh, looking for clear measurable social impact uh, and to invest in areas uh, where uh, we can make a, a real difference. Good. So I just want to remind you that if you have questions to write them in, in the Q&A part, then you can also put like if others like the, um, the some, there is a person asking here, 
why don't you invest in projects? Why do you choose to invest in enterprises? We have started, uh, when we launched ELEA, we have started to invest in projects and uh, also kind of uh, to, to learn from what other peoples do. And we have worked intensely also with aid organizations. And obviously there are areas where uh, projects are incredibly important uh, to uh, gain experience. The problem with a project fundamentally is that a project has a finite life. There is an employed project manager. Maybe there is a second follow-up project. Maybe there is a third project. But at some stage, the project is finished. And the project manager leaves because he's no longer employed. And that's what makes it so difficult to gain sustainable impact with projects. On the other hand, when you have an entrepreneur who basically has set his life goal uh, to build an enterprise over 10, 15, 20 years, uh, you don't lose what you work with him. He basically will uh, accumulate learnings. He will build an organization. He will refine his model. He will expand. He will grow. He will scale. And so the impact in our experience is A, bigger and B, more sustainable if you invest in companies rather than projects. Good. So they're asking too if you invest in developed countries that there, where there are also pockets of poverty. And I think that's interesting because you have a specific focus, no? Yeah. Yes, our focus is really absolute poverty and it is below $3 daily income. I would not exclude that in the North uh, there are pockets of absolute poverty, uh, but obviously compared to the enormous challenge uh, that we find in countries like Peru, like Bolivia, uh, like Zimbabwe, like South Africa, like Kenya, like India, like the Philippines. Uh, essentially, the poverty is there. Uh, and that's why we have concentrated uh, on uh, southern regions of the planet. So now that we understand the, the ethical motivation and the purpose of fighting absolute poverty and the specific issues that you actually focus on, you know, how do you do it? What's the operation model? How, what is the layer way of... Of, so that we can probably extend to other uh, other types of agents and learn from. The Alleway works on, on, on three pillars. The first and the most important at the center of it is uh, the process to find new philanthropic investments. That's essentially identifying, sourcing, evaluating, due diligence in new investments. And then once uh, we have uh, made a decision to invest in a company uh, to essentially help them as an active investor through a period that can go anywhere from five years up to 10 years in helping them realize the potential from a certain company. Uh, we typically go on boards, uh, we help in governance, uh, we help on functional areas such as uh, sales and distribution. We help on crisis management, particularly now, and we'll come to that a bit later. Uh, so that's the core of what we do. And that's where we spend maybe 70 to 80% uh, of our resources. And the criteria is always, do we make a difference? Are we needed? Uh, so the additionality uh, principle that Vanina mentioned at the outset is in our, is part of our DNA. The second is uh, our funding. Uh, it's philanthropic. So we do need uh, philanthropic capital in order to some flowbacks of exits uh, or of repayments of loans that we get. Uh, we have built over the years a circle of about 40 entrepreneurial families, foundations and companies uh, that help us. So while this is philanthropic money, so that means it is a donation uh, in a tax exempt foundation under Swiss supervision, uh, we treat it as philanthropic capital. So we essentially uh, have a kind of a contractual basis, which is like if you give money to a bank uh, and uh, invest it into a fund. Uh, the difference is just you never see the money again, but you get impact for it. And we'll come later on how that impact is being measured. Uh, so our philanthropic circle uh, of investors uh, is obviously incredibly important for ELEA uh, to be a sustainable organization that can continue to uh, source new investments, uh, to evaluate them and then to help them uh, through exit at some stage. And the third pillar is our professional development program, our staff. We have a staff of uh, 16 professionals, mostly with business backgrounds, uh, incredibly motivated, high caliber people. Mm. Uh, we recruit them. 
uh, and we look for people who have alternatives. They typically would apply uh, with uh, either large financial services companies uh, or other large corporations, uh, and they are attracted by the meaningful purpose that we can offer and by the opportunity to learn and to develop, to professionally develop in this uh, role as a philanthropic impact investor. And these three pillars, they uh, work like a flywheel. Uh, so the more uh, interesting investments we find, the easier it is uh, to motivate uh, philanthropic investors to provide capital. And the more capital we have, obviously, the more we can employ talent who then again find and source uh, new interesting investments. So that's essentially our model. Maria, Maria is asking, uh, you receive capital through this, uh, this circle of investors, but do you collaborate with governments or for other corporates or do you collaborate with other agents in the field? Yes, we uh, do have uh, some collaborations. For example, uh, we have done an investment jointly with the Inter-American Development Bank uh, in, in uh, Bolivia. Uh, we have uh, worked with uh, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau from Germany in certain investments. How it usually works is uh, that if there is a matched funding requirement, uh, we obviously try to mobilize capital from agencies. Uh, so we do not apply for capital with agencies, but when uh, agencies say, we essentially provide either a working capital facility or, we, or a long-term patient loan. Uh, if you provide us, if you come up with an equity provider, uh, then we are happy to match this in, in order to just mobilize more capital. So I think that that can be an interesting way of thinking of philanthropic impact investing, also de-risking projects, no? collaborating with other sources and blended type of finance models to de-risk uh, um, solutions. So some people also ask, and you were going to the, to the heart, I think, of also of, of what impact investment should be, because at the end, if we talk about intentionality, if we talk additionality, we want to generate certain outcomes. So we want to make sure it's not just because we, we think it's good, it's good. So how do you measure impact? And I know you have a proprietary uh, measurement, and how, what can we share with us uh, about measuring impact the LA way? Yes, that was a, a priority from the outset because I, as you have seen in my CV, I spent 10 years with McKinsey and I spent 14 years with the bank and I, I'm an economist. And so I was used to uh, have an idea on why am I doing, what am I doing uh, and what for and, and what is the result of it. And in a way, uh, it's amazing that the impact investing world has not yet come up with a global standard like uh, the financial uh, accounting standards that we have uh, for financial accounting. So there are no standards around. We looked at the time when we created a layout about 30 different methods. Uh, some uh, look uh, just at the number of uh, lives affected. We felt this is too superficial because it's a complete difference whether you enable somebody to get a training uh, that changes his life as opposed to benefit from uh, low price uh, coffee offering. Uh, and then there are in depth, deep dive studies from by sociologists uh, that look for two, three years in detail and uh, which are very interesting studies, but which at the end uh, are about as expensive as the primary uh, initiative. Uh, and so we were looking for a method uh, that would allow ELEA uh, to essentially, on one hand, set targets uh, mm -hmm. and help with the allocation of capital uh, and also help uh, comparing different investments uh, uh, with the same kind of standard of impact and finally help communicate uh, what we achieve and why uh, to our external investors. And so uh, the met methodology is essentially built around uh, a new currency impact points per thousand Swiss francs. That's how we measure what we do, uh, ELEA return on investment in terms of impact points by ELEA investments. How to exactly derive uh, to the impact points would probably take another two to three hour uh, <laughs> webinar, but just very briefly, we start with the beneficiaries, direct and indirect. We look at factors at different level, at the level of the individual in terms of how long, how intense is a benefit. Then we look at the concept, uh, the model, 
uh, how innovative is it, how transferable is it. We look at the organization, how sustainable is it, how well financed it is, how capable it is. And then we look at the risk uh, and, and, and whether we are able essentially to take uh, a, a specific risk and to be compensated for it in terms of impact. And then we calculate the project value uh, and we look at what is our own uh, contribution in some uh, investments. Uh, it is relatively small because we uh, essentially help somewhat with mentoring, uh, but we are not decisive. Uh, in other uh, uh, enterprises, honestly, they would not exist without us. So we have a huge leverage. Uh, and so we uh, then essentially determine what our leverage is and what our share is relative to other investors. And that's how we come up with our impact points. We have used this method now for essentially 10 years. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, uh, we got it uh, audited by an external audit firm. So we have a, a BDO, which is a kind of a worldwide network of external auditors uh, who look at how we uh, apply our method. Uh, we have a handbook on uh, this method uh, and they check uh, whether we adhere to our own guidelines, whether we are proper in calculating the points and so on. Uh, and uh, we felt this has been incredibly useful on one hand uh, to really compare completely different uh, investments uh, with this yardstick. And I mean, the range is between a few thousand points per thousand to a few points per thousand. So there's a huge range. And obviously, this is not something you can just apply without judgment. Uh, but it just helps to see what are the sources of impact, where is it coming from, where the differences are com coming from. And then we produce uh, a report, which you see in this slide, the Philanthropic Investment Performance Report, uh, which uh, we distribute uh, to all our 40 external investors. So this is in addition uh, to qualitative assessments uh, of our impact uh, at the level of uh, the specific companies. This is an analytical way to look at how much impact did we create, which is very similar to if you are an investor in a private equity fund and you get an annual report uh, on what your investment produce. We feel this is a very helpful and valuable way uh, to essentially uh, decide on uh, where to allocate your resources and then control your targets and uh, take corrective measures as you go along. Can I, uh, I, I, I will share a story here uh, a bit. Uh, I, was, I, I was at one of the end of the year meetings with the LEA circle of, of donors. And it was really interesting to see how the different donors were actually sharing uh, the impact points that they actually had uh, in the report. You know? So rather than comparing returns, they were comparing the impact. So I think other than just uh, measuring impact of your portfolio and choosing, I think it's also a, a very interesting way for donors and for, for people participating on the layer circle to internalize the idea of impact, you know, to, to actually see uh, how impact plays in practice. We have a question and I somehow my computer got a little stuck, so I'm trying to get the, the picture out, but we have a question about how the COVID crisis, how the coronavirus crisis has affected youth entrepreneurs and, and in general, if you want, uh, philanthropic impact investing. Well, I'll do this if you can share with us, Peter. Yes, of course. I mean, that's the uh, huge topic since uh, several weeks, as you can imagine. I mean, first, it has affected us uh, as a team. So we have gone uh, to home office work since uh, three and a half weeks now. Uh, we share uh, our experiences uh, at the video call, which is actually uh, today, right now, at 11, almost every day between 11 and 12. So mm -hmm. I, mean, with, I will miss it today. Uh, as you can imagine, unlike uh, hairdressers and restaurants uh, and uh, opera, uh, we have not less demand right now for what we offer, but we have huge more demand, hugely more demand. I mean, all our investments are in stress. Um, and uh, I mean, Vanina said it at the beginning, uh, I, whenever I listen to what our entrepreneurs on site have to say, uh, it just feels like an incredible privilege to be in a country uh, like Switzerland uh, or like other kind of developed nations where you do have a performing health system, where you do have uh, reliable institutional uh, capabilities, where you do have more or less 
competent governments uh, and uh, and the like. And obviously, a lot of that is just not there uh, in the countries where we are, where you have weak institutions, uh, where you have uh, almost non-existent health system sometimes for informal uh, settlements, uh, and where uh, governments take very erratic measures uh, with a, a very strange ideas on how that should be implemented. For example, social distancing in informal settlements, which just simply does not work. So most uh, or all our investments are affected, some more than others. Uh, most affected are the ones in skill building, because obviously they had to close training facilities uh, and therefore are left with uh, sometimes zero revenue. Uh, and uh, some are also less affected, all those with digital uh, offerings, those with access uh, of basic goods to uh, kind of the base of the pyramid, uh, they are in huge demand and are, are needed uh, right now to essentially help keep the countries afloat. Uh, so it's a very diverse picture. Uh, and so some are actually uh, very busy with defensive measures, protect the core of what they have. Other are more offensive, trying to leverage their strengths, for example, providing information, providing insights uh, to uh, people in rural areas who otherwise have no information or are exposed to conspiracy theory uh, or strange uh, kind of notions about uh, religious uh, or other type of uh, reasons uh, why we have this, uh, this virus crisis. We are in constant dialogue. We help uh, our entrepreneurs, uh, and it now obviously pays off that we have invested enormously into trust-based relationships. So we are literally uh, working with them on figuring out scenarios, uh, looking at realistic uh, kind of uh, worst-case scenarios. We have put aside a emergency funding facility, uh, which enables us. Uh, to make money available short term with very uh, simple decision making and with very flexible terms, not as a lender of last resort. Uh, we always want to have some company when, when we provide emergency funding uh, and also not to uh, kind of keep business models alive that may not have a chance uh, in this new environment. Uh, but we are uh, incredibly focused right now on helping our entrepreneurs dealing with this situation. And as I mentioned, the situation is incredibly challenging for countries like India, like Kenya, uh, like South Africa, uh, like others in that, in that area of the world. Good. So before we go to some of the learnings, because time flies when you're having fun, at least I'm having fun. Uh, uh, remember to write additional questions if you want in the chat that, that we can open up. But we have also a, a question from Manu that is asking, how do you manage to differentiate from PE or corporate VC money investing in impactful companies? So what, is, what would be the difference of what you do with uh, private equity and, and corporate VC? Well, we sometimes have them uh, alongside uh, our uh, investees, uh, and uh, sometimes this can be a very productive relationship because obviously the difference is that we tend to be on one hand more patient and we tend to be uh, more focused on social impact, uh, but some uh, venture capitalists uh, particularly appreciate us because of that. So they would then take the more impatient role and we would have the more patient role, for example, in a board. Uh, and that can be a very powerful combination. Uh, it is a, a, a very critical uh, kind of criteria when we do due diligence. So we want to know who are the other investors. They don't need to be all alike, but they need to be complementary. Uh, so a venture capitalist who has no understanding for social impact uh, and for patients, uh, that will not work. Uh, so uh, we would then decline an investment and would say uh, we would probably have a constant fight in the board. Uh, but a venture capitalist who basically says, I see the potential for financial return and I recognize uh, that this is also very important from a social impact point of view, but I just simply do not have the expertise and the experience and also not uh, the, the backup from my fund uh, investors. Uh, that's why I need a partner like Elea. Uh, then this can be very productive and very helpful for also for the entrepreneur because then the entrepreneur uh, gets exposed to a diverse set of stakeholders and investors in his governance. 
Would you say that, for example, this role that you're mentioning now is actually even more important when you're near the exit strategy? Do you see VCs asking you maybe to stay or when, when you're already past the, the, the getting a more mature scaling up process? Uh, absolutely. Is it difficult As to I, exit? <laughs> absolutely. As I said, uh, we typically invest into a kind of post startup and at this stage there is no VC money. At this stage uh, you would have uh, family and you would eventually have some angels and you might have uh, one or two foundations. Uh, so we tend to be among the first institutional investors uh, investing in an enterprise. And as we uh, help grow uh, a company uh, from post startup to early growth, uh, the case builds for attracting more VC type uh, commercial investors. Uh, and our ambition is that we are the last philanthropic investor on the journey mm. of developing an enterprise. So uh, we would uh, then see uh, commercial impact funds as a possible exit route for us. We have so far to be very frank, not have uh, a lot of track record on profitable exits. Mm -hmm. Also, quite frankly, because it's just such a, a new field. Uh, as I mentioned it, the term impact investing was coined in 2007. Uh, and up to very recently, there was not even the infrastructure for exits. Uh, I mean, there were no real uh, funds around. Uh, this has accelerated in recent years. I mean, today there are well over a thousand impact funds with about 500 billion US dollars of impact capital, but that's a new phenomenon. Uh, so we expect in the next five to 10 years, a more liquid exit market uh, to develop. We also hope that there will be some more secondary trading uh, so that impact becomes tradable uh, and that uh, there is a kind of continuum of uh, uh, going from discovery, from business plan competitions, from discovery of new ideas, from prototypes to startups, to early growth, uh, to then kind of established high performing impact companies uh, that will turn into real corporations. Uh, and I think that's essentially my vision of an impact economy uh, going forward. Good. Uh, and I'm, on that take, uh, one of the webinars we'll probably have later, there is an initiative uh, in Geneva and in Switzerland to do with uh, social stock exchange, you know, and they're precisely trying to build the pipeline and see what is the appetite and the liquidity to, to actually come up after all these years. You know, there, there was one question uh, on, do you give negative impact points? We uh, look every year at how the impact has developed. And yes, sometimes it gets negative. I mean, sometimes the delta between one year and the other is negative. For example, if a, co if a company uh, has uh, uh, difficulties to execute, uh, if it lost people, uh, if uh, there are doubts around whether the business model actually works or whether it doesn't work. Uh, so, yes, uh, this, is, this is actually uh, something we can see. Uh, here, Tommaso is asking, are you planning trying... Uh, using distributed ledger technology, blockchain, tech, etc. Well, one of my hobbies next to Elia I know, is that's I'm a, why I ask. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a board member in Signum, sure. uh, which is uh, the first uh, kind of fully licensed Swiss digital asset bank. Uh, and obviously, uh, on one hand, uh, because I'm a banker uh, historically, I've uh, worked in a bank and I find it uh, fascinating to see how banking is being revolutionized with blockchain technology, but somewhere, somewhere on the back of my mind, uh, I also see the potential of uh, blockchain technology for impact because fundamentally impact is about stories. Uh, and the beauty of blockchain technology is that it actually can attach stories to transactions with smart contracts. And so yes, over time I could see an application. Uh, we have been looking at the few examples right now but uh, to be honest uh, i'm not sure it's already mature enough for uh, investment cases but we continue to watch out for it good so last question i will put together we have a brainers and marco uh, they're asking how do you source the investments so or how do you select the companies and entrepreneurs you work with this is a process that has become quite sophisticated over the years 
Uh, when I was asked seven, eight years ago, uh, what is your bottleneck? I would say there are just not enough uh, interesting investments around. That has completely changed. I mean, right now, there is so much momentum in this space. Uh, and the beauty of technology is that uh, before uh, any company has anything, before they have a, prod a product, a customer, an employee, what they sure have is either a website and or a social media listing. Uh, so what we do is usually start with desk research. Uh, so one of our associates puts together a few hundred websites or Facebook entries into interesting ideas, interesting concepts. Then we screen it. Uh, we do calls from here, from Switzerland. Uh, we see uh, whether there are actually real cases behind uh, the social media. And then we do scouting tours. So uh, an associate goes to one or two countries for one to two weeks. Uh, he goes on site and looks uh, what could be interesting, does interviews, uh, screens maybe 15 to 20 different cases and then comes back with two or three uh, and then we do due diligence. So uh, we annually uh, maybe do 20 to 30 uh, detailed due diligences uh, based on hundreds uh, of proposals and we invest in maybe four to six uh, per annum. So we are highly selective. Uh, and uh, this is an, an expensive process. It takes a lot of uh, time, patience, but also judgment and analysis, uh, and is a significant part of what our associates do. And let me just mention, we were lucky enough last year in November uh, to actually have a discovery expedition with executive MBAs uh, going to Peru to perform, and, and Peter came too, was uh, in, in to perform a due diligence of impact of social enterprises in Peru and we used the LEA methodology. Uh, so it was very interesting process also to see it in, in practice. So just to, to start closing up, I would love to share it, another poll to you from all the learnings and the things you heard uh, today from, from generous Peter conversation, conversation and, the, and the experience of the LEA Foundation uh, of the LEA. Uh, what do you think is the most important role or aspect of philanthropic impact investing? You know, so is it enterprise building? Uh, is it bridging the gap uh, with commercial capital that we were just mentioning? Is providing patient capital, especially at the beginning until uh, the business model is well established and you're going to see many pivots happen during the, the, in, the investment process? Uh, is it all the above? What do you think? So I think it is very interesting. We have 50% says all of the above. <laughs> uh, and then we have almost split uh, this idea of bridging the gap and providing patient capital. Only 10% uh, enterprise. What I wouldn't say only 10% because 50% said all the above. No, but I think we have one of uh, a person in the chat that mentioned is Welly. Welly that is part of that work with Peter and actually said that more uh, than probably more than 50% or mo much more important than the money is exactly the, the enterprise building and the capacity that the LEA Foundation brings to the table. But I do think you probably agree that all of the above are important, but just to close up, what are the learnings? What would you like to stress uh, to this very faithful audience that stay with us? Uh, what should be the learnings? What can they take? You know, Paul. Yes, maybe just taking it from, from here. I mean, what we have learned is exactly that, that uh, enterprise building is incredibly important during that phase. Uh, and so today uh, we spend for every Swiss franc or dollar uh, that we essentially use for risk capital for either a convertible or a debt uh, or a, 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 even a grant, uh, we use another Swiss franc or another dollar uh, to basically help the entrepreneur cope with all the challenges that it takes to develop uh, business plans, to build an organization, to design governance, to uh, manage crises, uh, to raise funds, uh, and so on, and so on. So this is hugely important, has become uh, even more and more important. So I, I guess the overall lessons, uh, on one hand, it is hard professional work. Uh, you cannot uh, do philanthropic inv impact investing with volunteering on a Friday afternoon after a full work doing something else. Uh, this is a profession. This takes professionalism. Uh, and I think this is uh, maybe one of the lessons that we have learned. 
uh, we also learned that uh, there is an enormous satisfaction uh, and meaningfulness uh, when you go and visit companies, when you see what the difference uh, an enterprise such as Dharma Life or such as Angaza or such as Coffee Circle can make uh, to millions of lives in a sustainable way, uh, this is just incredibly uh, satisfying. Uh, the entrepreneurs are the scarce resource. It's not the money. There is a lot of money around, uh, but the entrepreneur and particularly entrepreneurs who are able to leverage capital uh, and to uh, leverage capital for impact and innovation, this is the scarce uh, resource. Uh, and that's actually uh, because we have learned so much that Vanina and I am um, in the process of writing a book, which is called uh, The Elea Way, A Learning Journey Towards Sustainable Impact. This is a book that uh, will be published by Ralph Letch uh, in fall. Uh, we are kind of in the final uh, stages <laughs> of uh, our, our script and it will summarize all the learnings and uh, it will all be around a formula, uh, a short formula that is entrepreneurship. Uh, times capital equals impact and innovation. Uh, it's these four terms uh, that are essential and the more they are integrated with each other uh, through uh, intense professional work and skills, uh, the more successful this is. And maybe a last point, uh, we see huge potential in building a community uh, across uh, LA entrepreneurs and beyond. And quite frankly, that was one of the drivers uh, why we decided to uh, support the LA Center for Social Innovation a few years ago. Uh, we just felt we are accumulating so much knowledge and expertise uh, that we wanted this knowledge to be somehow uh, be systematically analyzed and accessible. Uh, and uh, with Patrick and Vanina, we have uh, two professional researchers and academics and faculty members uh, uh, who are actually in a position to leverage our knowledge and then to make this knowledge available in a sensible way uh, to entrepreneurs, to investors, uh, to other academic researchers and to the kind of uh, curious uh, public. Uh, so that's what so, we are about. So thank you very much, Peter. You just gave away uh, my hidden agenda of this webinar. So actually that, that hidden agenda is uh, to invite you to be part of this community, you know, so uh, we, we cannot work it alone and a lot of these learnings will go to other actors and this is a little bit the excuse of the LEA webinars is to build a like-minded community that can mobilize uh, private capital in different ways uh, to, to confront the grand challenges that we're seeing today. And, and especially on that, if you want to share later with me your experiences or anything that you want to become a webinar later, please contact me or contact if there were any additional questions that we did not answer uh, to keep this going. But just to close up, I want to uh, thank Peter very much for, for the generosity to be here and also for bringing that passion uh, and life experience that is part of uh, I think we want to motivate here is that you can make a difference bringing who you are as a corporate, as an investor, as an NGO, uh, bringing the tools to actually bring solutions to market. And I think what we need now are to work on social innovation. And since I'm saying to contact me, let me share. Sorry, there we are. So thank you very much for for your participation in the Q&A, for staying with us this full hour. And here you have my email, you can find me on LinkedIn and social media, but also a Lea a email to, to stay in touch. And thank you very much, Peter. And so it's a Lea webinar series is officially open. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.